I call this sermon Connecting People to Jesus. When I think about connecting people, see, I, what is a connector? We're going to talk about that today. But I have identified one connector in my life. That connector happens to be my wife. She is very good at being a connector. See, when Krista finds something she believes in, look out. If she finds something that she truly believes in, she will spread it like wildfire. She will connect people that need to know this. Throughout the process of, of doctors diagnosing and telling us all about Kayla's thyroid disease and what that might look like or might not look like. And Krista grabbed that by the horns. And by the time she was done, she knew more about it than any doctor we visited. And she began to find truth. And she began to find what needed to happen. And she began to educate everybody around her. And she was on Facebook forums with people all over the world that had kids that were suffering from Graves' disease. And she began to connect them with the resources that they needed. Oftentimes she would be punching away at her phone and I would say, well, what are you doing? She said, just, just a moment, this is really important. We're helping this lady in Iowa right now because we're gonna change her daughter's life. She connected people. Whether it be gluten-free restaurants, yes. cloth diapering, breastfeeding, Oh, you just say breastfeeding in church. Get over it. It's something that happens. Whether it be job opportunities, makeup, babysitters, overall health, and yes, Jesus. My wife is a connector in all those categories. Now I'm going to step out because I have a microphone and you gave it to me. I'm going to step out and say, sometimes we don't talk, especially pastors or preachers, don't talk quite enough about the people that make everything happen, right? And I'm here to tell you that my wife is literally the most amazing human being I have ever met in my life. That's no, that's no shot against you guys, but she is the most amazing human being I've ever met. Truly anointed by God. Keeps so many things going on behind the scenes just so that I can get up here and do this. My son Reed is a blessing. He is a wonderful baby. He can also be a tyrant. He would have been a great communist leader. He's a great baby. But sometimes when he decides what he wants, that's what he wants. And most of the time that's her. So my wife is a connector. And this got me thinking about that. Every church has connectors in them. The connector in the church may not be on the leadership team. They may be a little grandmother that doesn't say much, but when she does, people listen. Because there's validity behind it. And she may be, may be carrying chocolate chip cookies with her. Amen? Yes. You know who you are. <laughs> Connecting people to Jesus should come as natural to us as telling someone about the latest restaurant in town. See, it should be as easy as telling them about the great deal we got at Walmart or some bargain we got at the grocery store. We tell people about the coolest video or post we may have seen on Facebook or other social media, but do we ever consider that our priority should be connecting people to Jesus? And we're going to read in John chapter 1 today about a connector. And his name was Andrew. John chapter 1, verses 40 through 42. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah. He brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas which means Peter. You see, Andrew was a connector. In the business world, we would call it networking. It's an exchange of information and ideas among people with a common profession. I managed banks for Wells Fargo and for US Bank, and we had all sorts of conferences meant for networking. These companies spent a lot of money sending us places so that we could network, so that we could connect. It was an opportunity to connect the dots, learn and find new resources that would make each of us more successful. But what I found was something different. 
People were too busy looking and acting like they had all the answers rather than getting their questions answered. As a result, there was no real connecting that took place. Why? Because there was no humility. Everybody came to these meetings. They put us up in these nice hotels. Everybody was in their best suit. Everybody was mingling around, but no one was willing to say they didn't know all the answers. No one wanted to put themselves in a position of vulnerability. They wanted to act the part. They wanted the perception that they knew it all. So therefore, everyone around them became just like that. And pretty soon, no one gained anything from these meetings that these companies spent so much money on. In the church, we call it soul winning. See, often it is misinterpreted as preaching from the street or handing out tracts. That extreme person that's out there doing the soul winning. That you're supposed to get out, that you're supposed to stand on the corner, that you're supposed to shout all about Jesus. Now, I'm not saying that those things are incorrect. There's a place for those things. But where soul winning really happens is a connection in your relationship. You have to have relationship with people. Otherwise, you're just a crazy man shouting from the top of your lungs on a street corner. Yep. The very foundation of soul winning is relationship building. We are supposed to build the relationship and connect. Mm -hmm. However, the same process I saw in banking plays out in the church. People don't want to appear vulnerable and uninformed. So they steer clear of conversations that might lead to personal growth. Why? Because you've heard me say it before, perception overrides truth. And why is that? Because even the church is to a point where they feel like what you think of me is more important or has a bigger role in my life than what he thinks of me. And that's wrong. That's no way to live a life. I've told you before, one of the most powerful things a pastor or a minister or anyone in a leadership role could say is, I don't know. Let's discuss it. Let me find out. See, I don't have all the answers. That may surprise, I don't know, maybe one of you. <laughs> I don't have all the answers. I'm growing every day just the same as you are. But the point is, you need to be growing. You need to be in pursuit of growth. You need to be confident enough in who your God is to go to someone and say, you know, I really don't know the answer to this question. I don't know how to solve this problem. Instead of sitting back and putting a post on your Facebook that says, I've got my coffee, I've got my devotional, I've got the beautiful, the beautiful sunrise. My miss, God is good. And all the while you're in complete turmoil because you won't ask somebody. Because you won't ask for help. Because you don't want to be perceived as weak. You don't want to be perceived as not knowing. It's time to start breaking out. Because if you live like that, you will never connect anyone to Jesus. So what compelled Andrew to reach out to Simon? What compelled him was excitement. What compelled him was belief. He says in verse 41, listen to this. We have found the Messiah. He was excited about what he had found. He had passion for Jesus. When you were saved, when you came to know the Lord, for those of you that know him as your personal savior, when you came to know him, there was a level of excitement that began to taper. Why? Because the depth of your relationship was not there. And for some of you that are hearing my voice this morning, it can be 30 years later and the depth of the relationship is still not there. Yeah. Without the depth of the relationship, without the personal growth, you will never be a connector like Andrew was. And you'll never be able to find the passion for Jesus. Because one thing to keep in mind is that you will not find something unless you've been looking for it. If you're not looking for humility, you're not going to find it. If you're not looking for growth, you're not going to find it. There has to be something intentional. Rex shared a, a blog the other day that made reference to something I said my dad always said when he would tell me you've got the talking part done. 
See, we can talk all day long about all sorts of dreams, about all sorts of things we want to accomplish, about all sorts of growth we want to have. You've got the talking part done. But when do we apply it so that we see change? So many people crying out for change. So many people wanting to be different. So many people wanting to find their purpose and destiny. And they will tell you that on Sunday. And Monday through Saturday, they could care less about it. Because they've just got the talking part done. It's not in their heart. It doesn't resonate. There's no depth. That is the greater part of the church we see in America today. We say, why do we have all these problems? Why do we have all these moral dilemmas? Why do we have all these issues? Why is the fabric of our society disintegrating? Because mostly the church gets the talking part done. You'll hear the word abortion come out of the mouth of a Christian nine million times more than you will hear the word adoption. That should soak in. We'll complain. We'll get the talking part done. But when it's time to step up and represent who Jesus is in this world, crickets. That's why we have problems. It is the nature of the Christian experience that those who enjoy it desire to share their experience with others. If you truly believe in something, you truly see the difference it made in your life, you want to connect people. I said in a sermon a couple years ago when I preached about how much I love coffee and how much I love Starbucks coffee. And some of you may have just said, well, do you know their political views? <laughs> Whatever. You want to dig deep enough? I couldn't wear any clothes. I couldn't eat any food. I get it. But I like their coffee. And Starbucks did something that no other company I know of did. So they had humble beginnings. Their first store was opened in Pike's Place Market in 1971, three years before I was born. The single modest store was a slim shop, shop front, that has multiplied into 15,000 plus spacious outlets in 50 countries. Wow. Starbucks deliberately avoided investing in traditional forms of marketing, such as advertisements in magazines, billboards, newspapers, or celebrity endorsements. Starbucks does not advertise. They don't advertise. Why? Because they rely on testimony. They now are a $1.4 billion company. That's a great strategy. They rely on word of mouth. They relied on the experience. People enjoyed their coffee and walked out and said, this is good, I love it, you should try it. And the next person came in and that person said, I love it. They came out, I love this. You should try it. When you come to know Jesus, you should say, look what he has done for my life. He has changed me completely. He has redeemed me. You should walk out of the doors and say, you should try this. But because of social stigma, we'll do it with a cup of coffee, but we won't do it with our Savior. There is something super wrong with that, guys. And it comes from within, it comes from the heart. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And if I'm talking about coffee and I'm not talking about my Savior, then coffee has a bigger portion of my heart than my Savior does. Come on. Truth. We have to share what Jesus has done for us. That's what a connector does. Don't be stingy with your Savior. The saddest person in the world is a stingy person. They don't share what they have. They don't share who they are. They don't share their talents. They don't share their love. Thank God Andrew was not a stingy person. Because as soon as he found who he believed to be the long-awaited Messiah, he went running home to tell his brother. Andrew was being a connector. He was connecting people to Jesus. And there are some steps that we need to follow when it comes to being a connector. The first is to evaluate your relationship with God. The one thing we don't like to do. Because when everything is truly right, truly right with God in our lives, we will want to invite people to our church. Notice I never said 
when everything is truly right in our church, we will want to invite them. It's when everything is truly right in your relationship with God. See, our church will never be perfect. It's never going to be the perfect environment for someone to walk into. Everybody in here can and probably has found at least one thing that they don't like. And you always will, no matter where you go, you will find at least one thing that you don't like. But that's only because we catch ourselves focused on the physical and not the spiritual. Mm -hmm. We should come in here expecting an encounter with Jesus, not an encounter with Chuck. Yeah. Yeah. You should come here wanting to shake his hand, not mine. Yeah. You should come in here and realize that if I came through that back door and I never greeted anybody in here and I just walked up and delivered the message, you might walk away thinking he doesn't care about me. He doesn't like, since when does my opinion carry such weight? You have a savior right. to think of. Yeah. That's who you came here for. Right. You see, you can get special speakers in. If I brought someone in of great notoriety who is, again, just a man wearing a collared shirt and holding a microphone, and some of the greatest speakers now, the most recognized, don't even wear collared shirts. They may have ripped jeans and an old sweatshirt on. But if it's a name, I tell you what, there would be no empty seats in this building, period. Because people would come from far to see a man. Even though Jesus shows up here every single Sunday. Yeah, yeah. Yep. God must be first in everything. Proverbs 16, 9. The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Mm -hmm. Literally, this means the heart of Adam devises his way. Anybody remember Adam? Yeah. <laughs> People will say, go with your heart. Let your heart lead you. No. No. Steer clear of your heart. Let Jesus lead you. Don't let your heart take you anywhere. You depend on Jesus for every last decision that you make. If I allowed God, if I allowed my heart to rule my life, I would have every possible piece of cash and credit I had maxed to the limit. I would have the nicest golf clubs in the world that I never went and played golf with. I would have the nicest cars I could possibly have. I would have a brand new hot tub. I would max it to the limit because I want these things in my life because I desire them because that's what I want. But when you focus on Jesus and he's in control of your heart, the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaks and you have the ability to have wisdom, yeah. the ability to resist such things, the ability to say, God, my hot tub's broke. Can you just please make it work again? And you think, oh, first world problem right there. My hot tub's broke, right? Yeah. Let me share something with you. My hot tub broke. I saved. Let me get a full first world problem here. I saved for like seven months so I could get a new cover because the hot tub that I inherited, the cover broke. But I love having that thing. It's some of the best thinking moments I have because nobody else in my family really likes to get in the hot tub. It's my sanctuary. So the new cover was coming and I got in the hot tub and I was sitting in it. And I was like, I can't wait for that cover to get here. And I heard a everything stopped. I changed the fuses out. I'm out there in shorts. My neighbors are probably looking at me through the scopes and their gun. I'm out there in shorts with no shirt on. I'm trying to put, I'm trying to put fuses in. I'm trying to figure anything out. Nothing. Everything. Nothing. I shut it all down. I walked away in disgust. I went on vacation. We come back. The new hot tub cover's there. And I'm in the garage. Oh, great. Yeah, new hot tub cover. Perfect timing, God. <laughs> And you're going to think this is all oh, this is this this is strange. This is weird. God works however God wants to work. Yeah. Holy Spirit says, "Go turn it on." It's <laughs> okay. I need to eat different. <laughs> so I keep working in the garage. Holy Spirit says again, "Go turn it on." The same Holy Spirit that tells me to pray for someone, the same one that gives me discernment. I said, hey, I talk all about hearing God's voice. So I went around and I reluctantly went and I flipped the switch. <laughs> on it comes. Everything working magnificently. I was able to put the new cover on it. And I stood back wondering how long this would last. It's going strong, guys. I sat in it last night when I was thinking about this sermon. God will meet you in the weirdest ways. 
Please don't go away and tell somebody. Well, today in church, my pastor told me how to pray for my hot tub. <laughs> Proverbs 19.21, many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Yeah. Make all the plans that you want. The purpose of the Lord is all that stands at the end of the day. We have to quit scrambling for answers and just look to the answer. The second is keep a positive testimony. Sometimes we don't want to share our testimony when life doesn't seem to measure up to the glory of God. When we don't want to, we don't want to let people know how much we rely on Jesus when we're out of money. We don't want to let them know how much Jesus has done for us when we're in the hospital. Because of the reaction we'll get from people, not because of what God will do through us. 2 Timothy 1.8 Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about your Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. In this scripture, Paul is encouraging Timothy not to be embarrassed about the message of the gospel, including Christ's shameful death on the cross, or his own personal imprisonment. Paul was imprisoned. He's saying, let people know about it all. It's all part of the package. Instead, God's power at work in suffering should cause Timothy to boast of the gospel without shame. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. In our schools, on our jobs, in our neighborhoods, and in everyday places that we go, we should make sure that we keep a positive testimony. Yes. No matter the perception of the circumstance, do not tell people who Jesus is. Show them. Yes. Yes. If you are sick and you are out in the community and somebody asks you, well, how are you doing? Don't respond with, my back is killing me. <laughs> I can hardly get out of bed in the morning. They've got me on this medication. They've got me on that medication. You can say, you know what? My back is hurting me, but I trust in Jesus. He has got this, period, end of story. Because you know what that brings up? Not, it doesn't bring up, oh, what medicine do they have you on? Maybe we could do a little pharmaceutical swapping, right? It doesn't give them hope in medicine. It doesn't give them hope in a particular doctor. It doesn't give them hope in somebody, massage therapist. It gives them hope in Jesus because that's the only person you've talked about. Yeah. He's your everything. He's your resource. And you know what that'll make people do? They will back up and think, how is it that you can be this way when you hurt? Don't tell people who Jesus is. Show them. The third is pray that God gives you a deep burden for the lost. You think, well, you're a pastor. This must come easy. No, it's never come easy for me. It's something I have to focus on. It's something I have to die to self on. I have to recognize how selfish it is. And I have to find humility and get on my face and understand this isn't about me. If I truly in allowing God to operate through me, then I will have a burden for the lost. Philip was a man God used to bring others to himself. But why was he so powerfully used by God? What was Philip's secret? It was that he had a burden for lost people. This was evidenced by the fact that he went to Samaria and preached Christ. That may not mean a lot to us, but it meant a lot to the Samaritans. You see, the Jews and the Samaritans were not very friendly. There was a rift between them that had passed from generation to generation. And Jews had no contact with Samaritans for the most part. Yet Philip, a Jew, went to Samaria and preached the gospel. Conversely, when God told Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach to them, Jonah went in the opposite direction. Because Jonah hated the Ninevites, who were known for their cruelty and savagery. The Jews and the Ninevites had fought with each other many times. 
So when God told Jonah to go to his mortal enemies, Jonah basically said what a lot of us might. No way. I know you. I know the way you are, God. You always forgive people. If I go preach to them, they are going to repent. You will forgive them. And I don't want them to be forgiven. I want them to be judged. Who in here has somebody like that in their life? I don't really want to share Jesus with them. I really don't want their relationship to grow deeper. I don't want them to be forgiven for what they've done to me. I want them to be judged. That's a selfish heart. That's a heart with no humility. But Philip was willing to go. He went out of his comfort zone and proclaimed the good news to the Samaritans. And as a result, there was great joy in the city, it says in Acts 8, 8. And there was great joy because there were healings that took place. People were delivered from demonic spirits. All because of a burden for the lost, because of humility, and because somebody was willing to go. You may say, well, I don't like to talk about demonic spirits. I mean, that was kind of one of those things that happened here there in the Bible. Oh, it is alive and well in this world today. If you don't believe evil is running rampant, sit down and watch your news. If you don't believe Satan doesn't have a hold in this world, sit down and watch. Pay attention to what's going on around you. The church needs to pull its collective head out of every new book that is released promising peace and revelation and start grabbing a hold of a burden for the lost. I'm not against learning. I'm not against authors. I, Mark Batterson is one of my favorites. But God comes first. What he says comes first. And he says we are to have a burden for the lost. This quote by Charles Spurgeon. I would sooner bring one sinner to Jesus Christ than unravel all the mysteries of the divine world. For salvation is the one thing we are to live for. Yes. We can have great discussions. We can get into theological discussions. But one thing is more important above all. You discuss all you want as people who don't know Jesus are walking by you. And they don't know who Jesus is. But it's because you're trying to unlock every mystery of revelation. Well, guess what? You're not going to do it. Nobody's going to unlock it all. Study is important. But get more than the talking part done. And while we're at it, let's define what lost means. Don't ever just assume that the only people who need connected to Jesus are outside the church's walls. Yeah. There are unsaved people in churches across the world today. Mm -hmm. And some may be preaching this morning. Mm -hmm. I'm saved, by the way. <laughs> I know who my Jesus is. But the church has went so far off course, there may be people... But eventually you're going to be told, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, for I never knew you. They say, but I did this, but I grew this church, but I did depart from me, I never knew you. Mm -hmm. Don't assume that you have to go to a poverty-stricken area in New York to find people who are lost. They are in your midst everywhere. And because people don't want to stretch themselves because people don't want to be wrong because they don't want to actually network that person may end up never knowing don't make assumptions there are unsaved people all over the world today it's our mission field you're sitting in a mission field right now and this, this quote by Charles Spurgeon brought me to my knees said every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. Yikes. That should have just pierced you. Because if we are not missional, if we are not sharing who Jesus is, we are an imposter. We're saying we're one thing, but we're acting another. An unbelieving world is never going to understand that. 
people will respond to you. Sometimes we don't want to talk to people because of the questions they might ask, right? Maybe I don't know that. People are going to respond to you in a variety of ways about your faith and your Jesus. And one common question is, why hasn't he come back for you yet? I was asked this just recently at a gas station. You're a pastor, right? Yeah, pastor of Church on the Move, Assembly of God. Let me ask you a question. Okay, I'm figuring, here we go. He says, at all these years since the Bible was written, all this time that has passed, and you say that Jesus is coming back, if he loves you so much, give me one reason Jesus hasn't come back for you. Mm -hmm. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. I said, you. What do I have to do with it? So I shared with him. Says Second Peter chapter 3, verses 9 through 10. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you. Not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. See, Peter is arguing against scoffers that made accusations against him at a gas station in 2 Peter 3.4. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. God delays the second coming so that more people can be redeemed. The day Christ returns, his entire kingdom will be inaugurated and evil will be purged from the world. He does not wish that any should perish. So I told this guy, why don't you get with it and come to know your Savior so we can get out of here? <laughs> he didn't take me up on it. But I guarantee you there was some thinking to be done when he walked out of there. He's a gracious and merciful God. Why is he waiting? Why has it taken so long? Because he loves his creation. He does not wish that any should perish. The context of verse 9, the phrase indicates that Jesus has not returned yet because he desires that none be lost. Every day before Jesus returns is a day of grace and represents the possibility of more people turning to him and receiving eternal life. John 3, 16 and 17 famous verses for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him everyone when it says come to repentance it refers to turning toward God and away from sin God desires that none perish. However, this will ultimately be a necessary consequence of the world becoming good and holy again. God will not force his will upon those who resist it. He will not force his will on those that resist it. People ask, why do bad things happen? He will not force his will. Why are these things allowed? Why does God allow them? He will not force his will. In Luke 8, we read about Jesus. As he sets a demon-possessed man free. And he sends the demons into a herd of pigs who run off a cliff and drown. He performs this miracle right in front of everyone. And after they witness it, they tell him, because they're fearful, go away. We don't want you here. This has scared us. This is too outside of the box. We need you to leave. So he got in the boat and he returned. Jesus knew that without him, all of these people would never have a relationship with his father. Without him, they would all be doomed forever. He came to save them, but they asked him to leave. In his power, God could have forced himself on these people, but rather than overrule their request, he granted it. 
And likewise, although God can do whatever he wants, when we ask him to get out of our lives, the most unexpected and scary things happen. He grants our request. I mentioned before about the time of spiritual possession and the time of, of demons. That that was just biblical stuff. It's not happening now. It's definitely happening now. And I want to make sure you all understand exactly where I stand on it. There is evil in this world. And it is running rampant. And if there is someone in our midst that is suffering from that affliction, we will pray and deliver them from that. Amen. You say, well, I've never seen something like that happen. I have. I've never prayed for someone that has had that happen. I have. And I'm telling you, it is real. It is afflicting more than you think. And we will not be people like that that tell Jesus, that is too far for us. That is too scary for us. That is too out of scope for us. Get on your boat and leave. Because Jesus has called us to do those things. That's right. When asked why God allows tragedies like 9-11 to happen, Ann Graham, the daughter of Billy Graham, answered, For years we've been telling God to get out of our schools, to get out of our government, and to get out of our lives. And being the gentleman he is, I believe he has calmly backed out. How can we expect God to give us his blessing and his protection if we demand that he leaves us alone? All right. There may be portions of your life that you want Jesus to leave you alone. You do not want to be stretched. You do not want to grow. So you tell him at that point, I loved you when you got off the boat. But after you did something like that that stretched me, I want you to get on and leave. Be very afraid because he will oblige. You take all of your Savior or none of your Savior. Yeah. His church needs to start acting like that. We need to pray that God would lead us to hungry souls that we can connect. Before we leave our houses in the morning, pray that God would open doors for us to meet people who are hungry and desiring more for their lives. We have to put ourselves in second position. If you're going to be a connector, a true connector, it can't be all about you. This quote by Dale Carnegie, you can make more friends in two months by becoming interested in other people than you can in two years by trying to get others interested in you. You have to show interest in people. You have to form relationships with people. And the biggest thing about that is you have to form them with not a care in the world of what's coming back to you. Because if you're looking for a return, you will be disappointed. There you, go. you give Jesus. You don't loan him. He's not yours to loan. You give what he's given you. Andrew was a connector. He didn't know it the day he went home from church and told his brother that they had found the Messiah. But that same brother would soon stand to his feet on the day of Pentecost and preach the salvation message because he connected him. As the worship team comes this morning, we knew his brother is the Apostle Peter who also brought that same message of hope to the Gentiles who unless you are 100% Jewish today is you. Andrew didn't know who Simon would become. But what if Andrew never would have told his brother about Jesus? The book of Acts wouldn't read the way it does. And neither would much of the New Testament. See, when you connect your friends, family, neighbors, or colleagues to Jesus, you leave the results up to him. He is the one who saves and transforms. We don't walk into it saying, I think I'll share Jesus with this person because they have a dynamic personality and they're a good speaker and I think I could see them being something someday. God knows what they'll be. God knows what they'll do. You let him take care of those details. Don't be worried about the result. Just connect them. 
This church, Church on the Move, is shifting gears. Has been for a couple of years now. This church is stepping up to the next level of where God wants it to be in this community. Change is in the air. And people love change. I know it firsthand. They're obsessed with it. Growth is in the air. What got us here is not going to get us to the new place that God is taking us. That is not something that is disparaging about what has taken place in this church. Over the years, 30, 40, 50 years. It just means that God is busy doing a new thing. He doesn't sit. He doesn't wait. He doesn't wonder if it can be done. He knows it can. He knows exactly who needs to be in place to carry it out. And I'm sorry it's me, but it is. God is using people. I pray every time I move someone into a position, I don't move them into a position because I think I see what they can do. I see what their potential is in this area. I, like I would in banking. I move them into a position because God said, move them into the position. And oftentimes I think, well, I don't quite understand. I don't know if they're cut out for this. God says, I know they're cut out for it. Be quiet. Move them into position. If you can grab a hold of it and say, yes, Lord, I want your will, not mine. Let's see what you're going to do here. He'll blow the lid off of this place. Churches all over the nation are going to want to be what this church is. Not a lot of people know about us. Not a lot of people come to our services. We live in a small town. These things can't be done here in Plains, Montana. Nothing good can come out of Nazareth, I believe I heard in Scripture. The only thing I know to come out of Nazareth was your Savior, Jesus Christ. So when you sit and say to yourself, nothing like what Chuck is talking about can come out of Plains, check yourself. Because God said it will, and it will happen. It will happen. The church is shifting gears. And the Andrews of this church are going to make it happen. The connectors are going to make it happen. See, the connectors are not going to let us stay here. If you like it how it is, hang on to your purple seat. Because there is an Andrew spirit that is about to take over this church. Amen. I read about a small church in a foreign country where the people would quietly sing songs but could not clap their hands. They could not respond outwardly in worship because it would cause their location to be found out. If they were found out, they would all be shot on the spot. So these believers would sit on their hands so they would not be tempted to accidentally clap during worship. Thank God we are still living in a country where you can tell people at the grocery store about Jesus. Thank God we can still talk about him in our workplace, in our neighborhoods. And thank God we can connect people to the one who can and will change their life and save their soul. Next time you find yourself tired, next time you find yourself not into worship, next time you find yourself with your hands at your side, remember, your hands are not lowered because you're not allowed to clap for fear of your life. Your hands are lowered because you might fear what he'll do with them if you truly worship him. Verse 42, he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas. That is an Aramaic word for rock. And translated to Greek, it means Peter or Petros. We can talk about evangelism, church growth, you name it. But it really boils down into the statement in that verse that says, he brought him to Jesus. If this Sunday, we all invited just one person, and that person came, we would double the size of the ministry potential that sits at Church on the Move. 
Only God knows who it is going, who is going to fill an empty seat. We have no idea what God might use them for in this church and in this community. Right now, they are just a Simon who nobody has taken the time to tell about Jesus. But look out. Because if you're a connector, they're about to become Peter, the rock of the church. Be the connector. Connect those people to Jesus. Don't sit and obsess over what Jesus is going to do in my life or whether he's going to allow me to see these particular things. If he's told you about those things, if he's promised you those things, they will happen. But we need to let the lost know in the church and out of the church that there is a time in every believer's life and it is now to do something to be something, not just a statistic, not just someone who comes and fills a seat, but someone who helps fill the seat next to them. Not just someone that talks about Jesus, someone that walks it, someone that shows them who he is. There are churches all over this nation that will not heed those words. Today, you are allowed to breathe. Today, you showed up at this service. Today is your day to hear this message. He means it for you. If everybody started acting like Jesus was our everything, he, he would be unstoppable. Connect people to Jesus. Heavenly Father, I praise and glorify your name. Lord God, I thank you so much for this time. Father, as I, I say often, I'm humbled to be able to stand here and deliver your word. I thank you for what you walked me through to get me to this point. But Father, I would ask that you would put it into all of us, Lord God, the way that I feel right now, that I'm not satisfied with where I'm at. I'm not satisfied with how I connect people to Jesus. I desire more, Father God. I want this church to desire more, Lord Jesus. Father, you have been pushing us, molding us, shaping us, cutting on us, Lord God, that we would move past where we have been and that we would move into what you have promised. Let us not turn our backs on that promised land. Let us not see something that scares us too much and turn around and walk out. Because if it is what you have promised, it will be successful, it will be joyful, it will be wonderful, and it will be peaceful. Father, I ask that you begin to swell our confidence that we would stand and show the world who Jesus really is. And that we would not bend to fear and we would not bend to anxiety, but we would simply look to you. And Father, if there's anyone here this morning, you do not know Jesus as your personal savior. You are one of those people that needs to be connected. Right now, at this time, is the time to know who Jesus is. I will be at this altar to pray with you and introduce you to Jesus, if that's you. Say, so why can't I just do it from my seat? Because I really feel like this is the time where we have to be intentional about our relationship with Jesus. And it should start that way. If you're here this morning, you're hurting, you feel like you've you backslidden, you feel like you just walked away from God, you feel like you're not seeing your full potential and destiny, you come let me know about that because he can change that in a heartbeat. If you need connected or you need reconnected, today is your day. Father, I pray that you be with everybody here and their families as well, Lord God. Hold us in your arms and begin to shape us into mighty conquerors, Father God. Through you, 
all things are possible. We praise and glorify your name for it. In Jesus' name, amen.